Please be seated. I have been looking forward to coming. And the reason I've been looking forward to coming is because of who you are. Intercessors, evangelists, frontline warriors in the kingdom of God. So, gosh, my colleagues, let me tell you. And I want to talk to you in terms of the sermon precisely with those assumptions. If I were speaking in a local parish church, I might say some things uh, less directly. But I want to speak plainly to you because I trust you and I trust the commitments that you've made to Jesus. Not that we always do them, you understand. Believe me, I get it too. (laughs) There's some people who think I do more than my wife knows I do, you see. It's just how it is. Doesn't mean we're not doing our best to be faithful. See, I'm talking plainly, right? So even when you make the vows and the commitments that you do, the, the most important phrase in those vows is, I will what? With God's help, because the goals are so high. The responsibility so great, the call to servanthood so deep, and perhaps even at times exacting, that I really do need the grace and mercy of God to be able to do it. Thank God my salvation is not dependent on how capably I fulfill those vows, that I am a sinner saved by grace, And that will forever be true until I stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And in being received into his presence, cleansed, you see, for all all of the incompleteness and the sin that is in fact mine. So that as the hymn says, I will stand before him faultless. But between now and then, (laughs) we learn to bear up with one another because they're always faults. Now, how as important is that? It's critically important because you see, there is nothing that gets in the way of servanthood and intercession, especially, than irritability. Irritability means I'm not happy because things didn't go the way I want them to. Irritability says, oh, there she goes again. Irritability is, you know, they haven't done this and that's what I asked them to do. You know, if you're going to do a job, I guess you have to do it yourself. And that attitude is accompanied by a kind of interior constriction that actually squeezes the possibility of you being open to God's direction. Now, that doesn't mean that God can't break through. I mean, you know, if he can break through of Saul of Tarsus, who was out to kill Christians, he can certainly break through to us, who may want to kill a Christian even though we don't. (laughs) So there really is grace even in the places when we are the most irritable. So, and you see, this gets right into what it means to, as we prayed, take up our cross. Because, and this is not original to me by a long shot, and you know it, the cross is actually that intersection point between the will of God and my capacity by grace to submit, even when I don't want to, when I would rather have my way. Because more often than not, what it feels like is not this sort of blissful intersection but my resentment somehow trying to push God's responsibility for me out of the way so I can finally, even if it's only for a moment, get what I want. Are you there? Does that make sense to you? Right. And so I want the collect, it seems to me, is very, very instructive for the way we should be thinking about this. Just to remind you, Almighty God, who sent our Savior Jesus Christ, was lifted high upon the cross that he might draw the whole world to himself. In other words, the colic states that as an historic fact. In other words, it's not up for a debate whether Jesus was really crucified and whether through his crucifixion he won the salvation of the world. 
the prayer assumes that we are gathered as believers and we actually believe that. So if you have questions as to whether or not that's actually true, then you need to go see your priest. And I, I'm not being facetious. All of us, because see, all of us actually have times where we look at the creed and other times and we go, gosh, do I still really believe all of that? That's not abnormal. All of us go through times of great affirmation and times where, you know, we show up just out of responsibility, not because we actually believe it. And we need to be honest when we have those moments of doubt and find ways to drill in and find answers for the doubts that we have. I think that's a part of what it means to do what Jesus asked when he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. So when there are places where your mind isn't sure, where you're weak in faith, where your soul is lax, the last thing you want to do is come into a kind of depressive complacency and sort of accept that as the new normal in your life. No, you, you treat it as just in the same way you would as if you had an illness. You know, if you have an illness, you want to go to the doctor. You want people to pray for you. You want to get the right medication. You want to do what you can to get back to health again. Because it can be consistently and even deepeningly debilitating. So it is when you have those questions, the things you're not sure that you believe, places like that in your heart, what are you doing? You're getting people to pray for you. You're drilling into the scripture in a deeper way. If you're seeing, if you have a spiritual director, you're going to your spiritual director or you're talking to your priest or sisters in Christ that you trust because you don't want this become to be a permanent condition. You want it to be temporary. And so if there's stuff that you have to go through to feel better and get well, then that's what you do. Even though, if it, even though it might upset your routine. Treat the spiritual malaise just as seriously as you would treat a physical one. Because you see, if you're called to step out and to be women of prayer and intercession, how can the enemy do his best to try to take you out and take you away from that position of, as it were, being on the wall of, in prayer for those who for those for whom you pray, that vigilant spot. Well, it can be just as simple as, am I actually even doing any good up there? Does God actually deal in some way that changes things when I pray or when we pray? Is he really sovereign over the whole earth? Or is Jesus just... You know, I, I mean, we could go on and on about with sort of the intellectual questions, the places, inner places of doubt. And like I said, all Christians go through them from time to time. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. But what it does mean is that you need to do something about it. So that's kind of point one. When you're in those places of feeling like I'm not sure what I believe or what's really going on, get with people. Don't do this by yourself. You wouldn't do that if you were sick, or if you do, that's a different issue. So don't do that when you're in the midst of some kind of spiritual malaise or sickness as well. So having said that, we believe that Jesus historically died on the cross and rose again, and by virtue of that, he won the salvation of the world, that he might draw the whole world to himself. Then it gets to us. Mercifully, notice, like I need God's help to do this, Mercifully, that we who, number one, glory in the mystery of our redemption, two, may have grace to take up our cross and follow him. And both of those are equally important. In other words, to glory in the mystery of our redemption is emotionally personal. This is not somebody else's faith we're talking. We're talking about your relationship with Jesus. I mean, the way I look at it is, is that to glory in it is to go, this is more phenomenal than I could ever imagine. God, how is it, world, that I even cut in on this? What is it that you love me so much 
the, the perfect spotless lamb of God would die on the cross, assume into his body all of the sin that I would ever commit, take it to hell and destroy it, and then rise triumphant on the third day and invite me in, sinner that I am, into that place of eternal life, knowing that I will be with him forever. I mean, that's glorying in it is, in fact, to understand that it is actually the most precious thing in your life, more so than anything else. This is a quote. This is Archbishop William Tenpole, who wrote a devotional commentary on the Gospel of John that I would highly, highly commend. And he writes this, talking about God drawing the world to himself. He says, he has promised to draw all to himself, even me, at last. Not as already, I trust, to an intermittent devotion, see, which is what we experience right now, a deliberate, though half-hearted service, but to that fullness of adoring companionship, which is foreshadowed in the promise that where I am, he will be also. Hear that phrase, adoring companionship. Intimate, tender, powerful. It is that, you see, to which we have been invited. Undeserved, entirely. Chosen, without a doubt. That's what baptism promises us and that we are not only going to be with him, but that we are in the companionship of his presence right now because of what God has birthed within us. Not something that I've achieved, but that God has birthed within us so that from beginning to end, it is all a sheer act of God's mercy. By grace, you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast. So to glory in the mystery of our redemption is to have that kind of almost gee whiz, how did I get in on this sort of wonder and knowing that that is actually emotionally effective in one's life. It touches you. It informs your mind. Does that mean you can explain it? Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, I can say all the words about Jesus taking my sin and yours into himself on the tree, nailing it there and defeating death and hell and rising, but can I describe that as a kind of mechanical, chemical process? That's why the college says the mystery of our redemption, meaning there's something in it that is actually beyond the capacity of human beings to be able to understand. And that God set it up that way. You see, because we, and particularly now, we use knowledge as a way to master something. It's a way even to exert control. When it comes to the quote-unquote mystery of our redemption, the whole point is, it is a gift to be received, not something that I can master. No, actually, it should master me. Hear the difference. Glory in the mystery of our redemption. And then the second phrase, may have grace to take up our cross and follow him. If, if there is within me that sense that God has birthed something eternal and powerful and stronger than anything that I could ever ask or imagine, and that it is a, an undeserving gift, and yet he chooses to give it to me out of the benefits of his grace, then my response to that is rarely one of obligation. It's more of how can I express gratitude any other way except to say yes to you even when I don't like it, even when I wish I wasn't being asked to do that, even when things don't work out the way I had hoped, there is a grounding that happens in us, in what God has birthed in us, that actually gives us the grace 
to be able to forgive quickly, to move beyond temporary difficulty, and to still know that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, even though something happened that I didn't like, and that he's going to continue to carry me and probably even my enemies <laughs> into his presence in a way that I can't even begin to imagine. So it will be well. See, you know, Julian of Norwich, all will be well. All will be well. So, sisters, colleagues, because you've been called to actually an extraordinarily important ministry, because our parishes would not survive without the intercession of God's people. It is his plan, meaning the plan of God, to fuel our common life through the power of the Spirit that is often released through the prayers of his people. Often. What you do is extraordinarily important, even if other people don't think so. And therefore, take care in the responsibility that he has given you. Watch out for the places of spiritual malaise. Find ways to say yes, even if it's not agreeable, because you're needed. The enemy will want to take you out, but you are needed for God's church and for his mission in the world. So please ask God to help you to keep saying yes. We need your prayers, and God has chosen you to help fulfill it. So may it always in the end redound to his glory, who through the hidden work of prayer not through the razzle-dazzle of upfront leadership. You can get a lot of people stand up and look good. But somehow if the prayer and the power of God is not present, it's all wood, hay, and stubble, to quote Paul. So keep praying. I, for one, am profoundly grateful.